All right, then, uh, yeah, as you heard, I can just uh, uh, repeat a little bit for the, those who are going to listen. But uh, uh, like Reed said, we had internet all until uh, the church service was supposed to start. And then there was some server problems with, by the internet company that caused this. And I don't think it's a coincidence uh, because the title of the sermon is Antichrist Reformation Agenda. And uh, I believe that uh, the devil does not want the world to hear this message. I mean, this is one of the last messages to this world, and I'm going to show you some practical examples on what is actually going on in the world, because Antichrist, or the devil is working through Antichrist to destroy God's church and God's message, basically. So, we have prayed, and I believe that uh, God will be with us, and I believe that... uh, I pray to God that he will send extra angels and push away the enemy because uh, this topic is a uh, direct and, uh, and tough topic. And uh, like I said, the devil is not pleased uh, with this. But uh, the truth has to be said, and uh, this is very important for these end times. So let's get started. Uh, Maybe while you're seated, I just want to have a short extra prayer because I believe this is so important that I want to pray again. So you, you can just bow your heads where you are and I will pray. Dear Father in heaven, I thank you again that uh, we can gather here. I pray for your Holy Spirit to be with us. I pray that you may hold back the enemy uh, as this is going to be presented. I pray that, uh, that uh, also others uh, through online may be able to see this message and uh, that you may show us the truth from your word. May you give me the the words, the right word to speak that comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so uh, last fall, I had a privilege to teach here uh, the first time, and uh, after that, I had a privilege to go on a little Reformation tour together with my friend, Joel, and uh, we got to see some of the, where the Reformation Started. Um, Martin Luther, he was a Catholic priest and professor, and uh, he made re- revolutionary discoveries from God's Word, and he saw that this system of the Catholic Church had serious errors. It was in the 1500s. And uh, this really shocked him, you know, when he saw what was really going on. And after a big struggle, he understood that he had to, to separate with the church somehow. He just didn't know, you know what to do. Uh, but uh, shortly after, he was actually excommunicated by the church. And in 1517, uh, he put up the 95 Thesis on the castle church, the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. And I know... You Afco students, you will be able to go there later in, in May, and I, I'm sure that will be a blessing um, to see these places, because this is the city in Wittenberg that where uh, Martin Luther and uh, Philip Melanchthon worked together, and this is the start and center of Reformation. So when I was there, I discovered some interesting things. Uh, all through the city... These uh, big posters were put. I knew about some things already beforehand, but now I got to see it with my own eyes. It says, uh, basically, Luther 2017, uh, 500 years of Reformation. And Wittenberg is getting prepared for, to celebrate 500 years in 2017 since the Reformation started. So I realized, wow, this is really going to be a big happening here. And uh, this is at the the town hall where we also saw these posters. And then there's another poster here that says, Theme year 2014, Reformation and Politics. And I saw that and was like, wow, that's interesting. That made me think about Revelation 13, because I know there will be a Reformation in politics uh, in the end connected with... Uh, worship. So I found that interesting. What, and something else that I found, here is still the town hall there in the background with these posters. And here, put a big globe 
uh, in the color of red, the color of Reformation or Revolution, and it says here in the Globe, Reformation 2017. So, does the Bible say anything about Reformation? I already said that, Revelation 13, among other places, and we're going to take a little, a brief look at this today and what is going on in the world. Uh, but before that, I would like to give you uh, seven biblical facts about Antichrist. Uh, there's, there could be a lot to say, but these are maybe some of the more important and clear ones. Uh, that, that how, how the Bible describes Antichrist, because I believe that the Bible can give us the answer who he is and what he is doing and how he will deceive the world. So, if you have your Bible, please come with me to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. We don't have time to go through this whole chapter, so I'm going to briefly give you uh, a background. Because here, this is a prophecy. You see, there is, uh, Daniel sees in a vision, uh, some beasts coming up. Different beasts which represents kingdoms. Different world kingdoms, powerful kingdoms through history. And in verse 7, we're going to start from verse 7. And this is coming up a, uh, a little bit closer to our history. It says in verse 7, and verse 8 I'll read uh, also. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. In short, this is described in the Roman Empire that was indeed breaking in pieces and was really cruel to its enemies and even uh, with their own soldiers. A very uh, cruel kingdom. And then it says it had ten horns, which is representing the ten kingdoms that were arising through uh, this kingdom that caused its fall in 476 A.D., we, I could say a lot more about the Roman Empire, how it fits to this prophecy, but like I said, we don't have time. Uh, in verse 8, it says, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Okay, so this is describing what will take place after these ten kingdoms were established. Because this was turning into what we have today in Europe. But three of these ten were supposed to be plucked up by the roots. They were going to disappear from history. And indeed, we have the, the Heruli, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, that were plucked up by the roots and giving space to a little horn, which also represents a kingdom. Uh, we find from Daniel 7, if you study more. And this little horn is the Antichrist. We will see and discover more what this is. And here are a few of the first points that we, how we can find out who Antichrist is. You have, it says, it arises between the ten tribes of the Roman Empire, which we have, which we have seen here, this beast, uh, after it was divided through the, the division there. And it was going to be a little horn, a small kingdom. And then three kingdoms will be plucked up by the roots, like I said, uh, as this, this kingdom shall arise. And then it was going to be a blaspheming power that speaks the great words against God, the Most High, that is God. And in Revelation 13, it talks more about this and calling it blasphemy, a blasphemous power. And uh, if you study Revelation 13, you will discover many similarities with Daniel 7, this first beast of Revelation 13, and it will show you that it's talking about the same, uh, the same system, it's talking about Antichrist, the same characteristics. So what does blaspheme mean? We need to define this. A blaspheming power. The Bible comes with a definition of what blasphemy is. 
According to the Bible, blasphemy means to claim to be God. John 10, 33. Claim to be God. That's why, why Jesus was accused for blasphemy. Because he did and claimed to, to have the same power as God. That's why they wanted to kill him. And then there's one more. And that is claim to be able to forgive sins. Like Jesus also claimed to. In Mark 2, 5 to 7, if you want to have the reference. Mark 2, 5 to 7. Uh, so this is blasphemy. Okay? And let me tell you, because the reformers, as well as most church founders, once believed that the Catholic Church is the Antichrist. Luther believed it. John Calvin, or sorry, Calvin and Knox, they all believed it, that, that the Catholic Church was Antichrist, according to the Bible. Let's see if this actually could be. In the Catholic Church, I, there are many interesting statements, but here are, here's a few. Have no fear when people call me the Vicar of Christ, says Pope John Paul. When they say to me, Holy Father, or Your Holiness, or use titles similar to these, which seem to even inimical, or like I put there, to cause harm to the Gospel. Interesting. So they say, well, the Pope is basically the vicar of Christ, the replacement of Christ on earth. That's what they say. Okay? The Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but is Jesus Christ himself hidden under a veil of the flesh? Does the Pope speak? It is Jesus Christ who speaks. I don't know about you, but what we discover from what blasphemy is, I mean, this can be no other thing. They are claiming to be God on earth. Very, very sad. And then one more. The priest has the power of the keys or power of delivering sinners from hell, of making them worthy of paradise. And God himself is obligated to abide by the judgment of his priests. They're putting themselves above God by saying this. And this was said, I mean, the, the, the former quote was from Cardinal Sarto, who became Pope Pius X. And this is in a book, uh, Dignities and Duties of a Priest by Liguri. Okay, so we have seen these quotes. Let's see more what the Bible says regarding this. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse uh, chapter 2, verse 5, sorry. Chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Only Him could be the mediator. No pope, no pastor, no leader. Okay, it's only Christ Jesus, the Bible says. And only God can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus is our only mediator. Re uh, Revelation 1.18 says, I, this is Jesus speaking, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. What did the Pope say earlier? He said basically, the priest, well, the Catholic Church, the priest has the power of the keys, of, of power of delivering sinners from hell. But Jesus says, look, I have the keys of hell and of death. And they are, they are counterfeiting this as well. John 2, 22. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment for, to the Son. They said, like we saw in the quotes, you know, God has to follow our judgment. He is, to, you know, they're putting themselves above Him. But Jesus, uh, God has given, committed all judgment to the Son. And let me make it clear by now also that when I talk about the Catholic Church, I'm not talking about the people, uh, individuals, I'm talking about the system. How the system is, because I, I believe there are many wonderful people in the system. So, but the Bible is giving description and warning that we need to deal with. This is why I'm addressing this, because I don't like to talk bad about individuals, because only God knows their hearts. All right. Let's see what else. Uh, we, it was, uh, okay, let's maybe read Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 before we start this. Daniel chapter 7 verse 25. It says, he, talking about the same, this same power, this, the little horn, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High. 
We have seen this is blasphemy, right? Shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law, and the saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Three and a half years. The word time here means can also mean year. Three and a half years. That's what it says. So, he was to think to change times and law. Antichrist was wanting, attempting to change times and laws. Has the Catholic Church done any changes? Well, the second commandment uh, is removed in the Catholic Catechism. Talking about uh, making images and, and falling down to them and, and serving them. All right? And the fourth commandment is changed. What does the fourth commandment say? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. She shall work six days, but the seventh day is holy. This is God's Sabbath. They have changed it to remember to keep holy the Lord's day. Well, I still believe the Lord's day is a Sabbath, but when they say the Lord's day, they mean Sunday. And here are a few quotes. Here are a few quotes. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transfer the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday from the book The Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine okay and another one of course the Catholic Church claims the change that the change this change was her act and the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority and religious matters oh, this is also interesting in relation to the mark of the beast, which is ta uh, talking about in, in Revelation 13. They say this is a mark, this is showing our power and authority to be able to change God's word like this. It's interesting, when it says to think to change times and laws here, the word times, uh, simnin, this word is in plural, and it's actually referring to to repeated points of time. And the only commandment which deals with repeated points of time is what? The fourth commandment. Because it's happening every week. Right. Repeatedly. The Sabbath. The seventh day. So, this is what they have attempted to change. Or say that they, we, they have changed. But no one can change God's word. Whatever, how much you try it, it's just still there. And valid. And then we saw that so they have changed the commandments. Attempt to change them. Okay, so the Bible says in Exodus where we find the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down yourself to them nor serve them for I the Lord thy God am a jealous God. The second commandment. That obviously they had a problem with this because they have a lot of images in the churches, uh, and uh, some people are really bowing down to them and kissing their feet and worshiping them. Very sad. Um, and then, of course, the the fourth commandment: remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's the seventh day. I just took the first part of it. It goes further on. Matthew twelve eighteen. Uh, sorry, Matthew tw twelve eight. For the Son of Man, and Jesus is speaking here, the Son of Man is the Lord, is Lord even of the Sabbath day. The Catholic Church says, you know, we can make this change, we have authority to, but Jesus says, I have, I am the Lord of, of the Sabbath day. He made it, instituted it, He is the Lord over it. No one can say, I'm the Lord over that. Okay. And then it was to make this Antichrist power was to make war against the saints, found in Daniel seven twenty five and Revelation thirteen five to seven. Here's a quote. I found many quotes, but here's I chose one. It says, "This great anti-Christian power robbed the church of its gospel light and plunged the world world into the dark ages. One thousand years covers the quest of the persecutions went from fifty million." 250 million martyrs uh, died of the, sword, of the sword. At the stake, in dungeons, and of starvation because of the confiscation of their earthly possessions. We don't know the exact, exact number, but there are millions killed 
or died because of the persecution in the dark ages of the Catholic Church. Very sad. Because they did not want to obey them. They rather said, you, you know, we're going to stick to the Word of God. Many Protestants were killed because of this. Okay. And the seventh one, I'll also give you a summary here. It's, this power is going to persecute the saints, persecute God's people, like we said, so, but for a specific period. And I, I told you three and a half years, that's what it says, a time, times, and half a time. Uh, in Bible prophecy, in apocalyptic, apocalyptic prophecy, uh, we have to apply, uh, from the Bible, there are several, several reasons, and we have talked about it in the classes for those of you who were there. Um, so it says, one, we're supposed to take one day for a year uh, in these prophecies to make them right, because they are in a symbolic context, so the time is also symbolic. And we don't have time to talk much about that, but here's some references to all the times, all the periods of 1260 days, which is three and a half years, which is mentioned in the Bible. So this is, with other words, 1260 years. And it started, the little horn, the Antichrist power, the Catholic Church got into power, you can say. They, of course, existed before, but they got more into power in 538, when Rome, the city of Rome, was free from barbarian tribes. It there was a lot of tribes coming, rising and going, and, you know, so it, that's when it was free, and um, that's when the Pope took seat. Okay? And uh, here, from here, it goes 1260 years until 1798. If this prophecy is right, uh, then something would happen here. Uh, and like the Revelation 13 says, that this power will get a deadly wound. One of the hands will get a deadly wound from this, this beast, uh, but this wound would get healed, like we heard in the scripture reading. In 1798, uh, Berthier, which is the, the, um, the general of Napoleon, he entered Rome on the 10th of February, 1798, and proclaimed a republic. In 1798, he made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. So this power got a deadly wound, but the Bible says it will heal. Okay. So here is a summary. This power, uh, with, it arises within the ten tribes, the ten kingdoms of the Roman Empire that, were, that was divided. It is a small kingdom. Three kingdoms will be plucked up by the roots as this small kingdom arises. A blaspheming power that will speak great words against God. It will think to change times and laws and make war against the saints. The saints will also be given into their hands for three and a half years, prophetic years. 1260 years. And with, all, with only this description, it cannot fit to another power. If you look at it, it has to be a small kingdom in Europe. And the Vatican is the smallest kingdom here in Europe. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's church and state combined. And it came out of the ruins of Rome, which Antichrist was opposed to. And it came as a result that it came to power because three of these tribes and these kingdoms were plucked up by the roots, they were fought, they were distinguished. So it cannot fit to another power, but there are also other, other reasons I could give you, but for the sake of time, this is what I give you now. Okay. So let's take a look now in the Revelation 13, which I told you briefly, it's talking about the same power. Revelation 13, verse 1. And now it's, it's starting to get exciting. It says, Then I stood on the sand. This is John speaking, seeing a vision. Stand, I, I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. Here you see the same. Ten horns, the similarity. And on his horns, ten crowns. And on his head, a blasphemous name. Okay, and if you continue reading, you will see many more similarities to Daniel 7. 
But then what happened in verse 3? Like we heard, it says, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. Okay. So, but then it is, it is describing this, this beast, and, and in, in many ways uh, the same as we have seen in Daniel 7. And then in verse 11, another beast comes up. This came from the sea, which is a symbol in, Bi- in the Bible of peoples. And you find that symbol, uh, for instance, in Revelation 17:15, uh, peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And this was indeed Europe, a lot of people. This is how it came up. But here, in Revelation 13, 11, a new beast comes up from the earth. That's the opposite. A place where you cannot really find many people. Okay? So let's see. And in verse 10, it's talking about this captivity. Let me read it. Of the first beast, the Antichrist. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. Captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. This is what happened. He was killing people with the sword. He was taking people in captivity. Now it's his turn. And that happened in 1798, as we saw. And now in verse 11, during this time, it says, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And this, so this is coming from, or a place, or a country, uh, or a place of, of the world, an unpopulated area. Around this year, 1798. Okay, but, um, so who could this be? Some interesting clues. Uh, it says here, in Revelation, in the former chapter, in Revelation 12, verse 16, it says, the earth, this is regarding the persecution that happened, the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon, Satan, through the means of the Catholic Church, cast out of his mouth. And by the way, the word woman is a symbol in Bible prophecy for church. So God's church were persecuted, but the earth helped the woman. And you know what happened during this uh, 1260 years, the Dark Ages, many Protestants, they were fleeing to America. They got help from the earth. They got help there because there they could worship freely. That's what happened. And also, many found help uh, during the, I mean, the, you had the Valencies found help in caves, I mean, literally in the earth. But I believe this earth, I mean, this must be a place on earth that was not very populated. And that's America. That, that's what happened. Uh, many Protestants were fleeing there and got help where they could vers- worship. So, we see that the earth helped the church and um, many, many thousands of Protestants, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands even fled to America. But, I wish I would have time to maybe give you more clues, but uh, this is believed by, by, uh, by some to be America, and I believe so, I believe you can see that. And this power, it says in verse 15, uh, this second beast, he had power to give life in, unto the image of the beast, that is the first beast, which is Antichrist, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast, or Antichrist, should be killed. So the United States and the papacy will somehow cooperate in the future. This is when the wound will get healed. And the United States will help papacy to put death penalty to the dog who refuse to worship the papacy or what the papacy will put up called the image. And if you refuse, you will get healed. Just like in the dark ages. What happened before will happen again. Similar things. So, can we see any healing of the wound? This is what we will take a look at now. And uh, Revelation 13 describes a reformation of politics, like I started off by sharing this posters that I saw for the, the theme year of last year, 
in Wittenberg for this reformation. And um, let's see here. Here are a few interesting things, and news mostly from last year. The evangelical church in Germany uh, have invited Pope Francis to take part of the reformation 500 years anniversary in 2017. I mean, first of all, how can that be? You invite the, the head of the Catholic Church, uh, which was the result of the Reformation, that people went out and started the churches. You invite him to come and take part to celebrate with you. But that's what is happening. It was uh, Nikola, Nikolaus uh, Schneider, uh, the chairman of the, the Council of the Evangelical Church in Germany. And uh, during this meeting, the Pope underlined how important it is for him that we as churches walk together on the path of testifying the faith in this world. That's what the Pope said. And also, Schneider, he said, you know, the conversations with the Pope and the Vatican, uh, it contributed to build trust between us. Trust. Why would the Pope visit Wittenberg, the start and the center of Reformation, in 2017 to... to commemorate the 500 years of Reformation. Well, I don't know for certain that he will be there because he has not yet made it public, his answer. But I believe we have good reasons to believe so. And I will share uh, some other interesting uh, quotes here. Uh, here is uh, the Catholic ecumenical officer, Bishop Gerhard Feige. He, he uh, you know, because what happened before I, I read his quote... During the 1540s, a counter-reformation started in the Catholic Church as a result of the Reformation. But the last decades are proving that things have dra drastically changed. Now, more and more churches seek to unite again with the Catholic Church. And this is what, the ca this, is what this uh, Catholic uh, uh, Ecumenical Office Bishop Gerald Feige says. One would almost say that the Catholic Church has set out from that path of the counter-reformation unto that of the co-reformation. Well, that's basically what we see in the world. I mean, more and more. And also, he says, he's referring back to reconciliation process that started years ago between Christian Protestants and Catholics. And he sees evidence for this to develop during the coming years. And after this, he says, I would appreciate if this, the cooperation, you know, uh, or the, the evidence for this development of closer bonds of Catholic and Protestants, I would appreciate if this were not only happening in the leadership of the churches, but everyone must, must change and get on the move. It remains to be clarified how much unity is necessary. So in other words, there are already existing a lot of dialogue in leadership of the churches, according to him. And, well, we can see that also uh, pretty openly. So... And here comes another interesting thing. Uh, some of you have, may have heard of the Luther Garden in, in Wittenberg. How many of you have heard of it? The Luther Garden, okay, some of you. So this is arranged by the Lutheran World Foundation and the United Evangelical Lutheran Church of Germany. Basically, the goal is to have 500 trees uh, in this new garden. And churches are invited to come there and plant a tree... And they're going to plant one tree at their home church from all over the world. I mean, and churches all over the world are participating in this. And basically, in the middle of the garden, here, you find the symbol of a Luther rose, which is the, which is the symbol of, of Luther's uh, theology, basically, and faith. And here are five trees and seven ways symbolically leading out to the world. And here are the rest of the trees around here. And these five trees are interesting because they are in the center, they are in the middle. And all these trees are numbered from 1 to 269, which, which they currently have. They want to have more, but that's what they currently have. Can you guess which church is number one in this uh, creating a global ecumenical network? That's the point, to create a global ecumenical network. Can you guess which is number one based on what we have been looking at so far? Can you guess? The Catholic Church, yes, that's number one. I, I ran around to look at every single tree there. <laughs> when I when I was there, I had very little time left. It was the last thing I was doing, and I was, you know, I saw this. Wow, you know, that church, the Swedish church, 
from Africa, from America, you know, from Asia, all over the place. And then this one, number one, the Catholic Church is number one. The second one, the Orthodox Church. The third one, Anglican Communion. And then World Alliance of Reformed Churches, the World Methodist Council. These are just to mention a few of the churches I saw that, but these five are in the middle. And this is number one. Can you imagine what's going on and what's happening with the Reformation? And one responsible for, for the concept and design. And here's, why, by the way, here's the tree number one, I think. And here's the middle, the Luther Rose. Uh, it was hard to get an overview of it, but um, you saw it a little bit. But well, one response for, for concept and design of this Luther Garden, he says in an introduction movie on luthergarden.de, I hope this garden will one day grow into a park, a park in which people can gather under the trees, a park that grows together, just as our Christian world religion should grow together one day. It seems like the Protestants have forgotten the Reformation and the real roots of it, and the real reason why we exist. I don't know. But I don't know what's going on. Well, I actually do know, because the Bible prophesied, has prophesied it, you know, said beforehand. And in 2014, we have uh, Kenneth Copeland. He arranged a leadership uh, conference for charismatics, uh, evangelicals in the States. And Tony Palmer, he was, you know, an Anglican bishop. He was there speaking. And he had... He was a good friend with the Pope, and you know he got a special video message from the Pope to this audience. But this guy said repeatedly in his speech, the protest is over. Let's go back and unite with the Catholic Church again. Let's stop being divisive. That's what he was saying. And all the audience seemed to agree with these evangelicals, with these charismatic leaders. They all seemed to agree and embrace this message. While some of these uh, Protestant churches have stopped protesting. What does the Catholic Church else say? Let's see. Um, here is on the, Vatic the Vatican website. I found an article here called From Conflict to Communion. And it says, Lutheran Catholic Common Comm Commemoration of the Reformation in 2017. Okay, so let's... This is a long article. I haven't read a whole one. It's like a long document, but... Uh, what I found, I mean, I'm just going to give you a few quotes from it. Um, because, basically, they are they're taking a look to how can we together, the Catholics and Lutherans, uh, come back to un un unity again between us. And uh, these two churches, they signed a um, document called a, a Joint Declaration of Justification by Faith in 1999. And this was to to an attempt to narrow the theological divide between the two faiths. That was the reason. Um, but here's the thing. Luther did not only discover justification by faith. It was how many th uh, theses on the door? 95. And they, they seem to just talk about this, the justification by faith, and, the, you know, okay, we discovered it, we, have, we can meet here, so let's, uh, let's unite. Here are some quotes from the article. The awareness is dawning on Lutherans and Catholics that the struggle of the 16th century is over. Just like Tony Palmer said, like, the protest is over. The reasons for mutually condemning each other's faith have fallen by the wayside. Thus, Lutherans and Catholics identify five imperatives as they commemorate 2017 together. So then they list five points, how they can successfully unite again. And then, it, then they say... In 2017, we must confess openly that we have been guilty before Christ of damaging the unity of the church. This, commemor me this commemorative year presents us with two challenges. The pur purification and healing of memories and the restoration of Christian unity in accordance with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what? They also, in this document, invite other Christians to study carefully open-mindedly and critically and come along to, uh, to the way to a deeper communion of all Christians. So they, their goal is not only the Lutherans, but they start with them, this, which seem to co cooperate more and more, but they want all Christians to come along to, to the way to a deeper communion together, right? 
but uh, the, in 2017, um, it says Lutheran and Catholic Christians will commemorate together the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation. But also, this will mark another milestone for them, because they, this is 50 years, it marks 50 years in 2017 of Lutheran-Roman Catholic dialogue. So they have more reason to be happy together. Um, but can you see what is starting to happen in the world? More and more? I mean, you see almost now daily news about the, the papacy and what they are doing. And, you know, something new that is a fulfillment of prophecy. Just more and more how, he, how people look up to the Pope and adore him. So, I mean, from where is Protestants, where is non-religious... It's, it's amazing. I believe the world has started to wander already. As we saw in Revelation 13, verse 3, they have, it, they have started. It's going to be much more. But, I mean, what is going on is just showing that. Because, here in Revelation 13, verse 3, let's read it again. It says, And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed after the beast. You know, healing of a wound takes time. Slowly but surely it gets healed. And I, th I think we are in the, in, the, in, the, in the final phase of the healing of this wound because people are already wondering right now. Several leaders of other churches have now joined the Catholic Church. A big mega ch church leader in Sweden joined the Catholic Church now. And people were shocked. He had a great audience, like great... Uh, a great church with several thousand members in Sweden. Suddenly, I'm going to become a Catholic. Okay. And others too. We're really looking positively to, to Catholics. All right. Um, but we have to remember. Because if you ask Christians today who Antichrist is, they don't, most people, they don't really know. Or maybe have some ideas, but it's not a clear idea who it is. But now is the time to find out. And I hope that you will see it from my presentation, not only what I say, but from the Bible and what is happening in the world today. And like I said, there are sincere believers in this system, in this false system. They live up to the light they have. And, you know, so we are not talking about the people, we're talking about the system. But someone has to tell them the truth. So who will go? This is my question today. Here are some, some uh, headlines from the news. Um, and, uh, you know, since Pope Francis was elected, very quickly he got the knowledge internationally. Here are some, I mean, I, there are so many, I, I, I could not fit them all into this presentation. Can Pope Francis heal the deep divisions in Christianity from Boston Globe? Pope Francis continues to take the world by storm. It reminds me of the words we just read. Take the world by storm. All the world wander after a bit. Uh, interesting. Um, and then here, this one. Pope Francis is only leader respected enough to end today's wars. You see what is happening? More and more people get respect for him. And the former Israeli president, like he says in the article, Shimon Peres, asked Pope Francis to head a parallel to the United Nations called the United Religions to counter religious extremism in the world today. And you know what? Revelation calls this, it says in, in verse 4, right after this, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? No one. Because they respect him so much that he's the kind of the peace advocate in so many conflicts. I mean, we have, he has been peace advocate like between Jews and Muslims, United States and Cuba, and the harassment done with ISIS, and he, the list keeps going. Because people look up to him in many, many respects. So, here's one. Uh, yeah, like I mentioned, Pope Francis takes a public role in US Cuba relations. And then here, you have. You have one uh, about regarding Obama. Uh, this is in Time magazine. There was the Time Man magazine. They listed the world's most influential people of the year. And, and as you see here, Barack Obama was the one that was asked to write about Pope Francis. The President of the United States. And he said, a moral leader in word and deed. Rare is the leader who makes us want to be better people. Pope Francis is such a leader. 
Very interesting what the words that he's writing through this article. And also, there was an article that said Pope Francis calls for, uh, for an end to fundamentalism. And with rightly, rightly so, but it reminded me what will happen in the very end times when this wound is completely healed. You know what will happen then? It says, like we read, that if you refuse to worship this Antichrist and the image put up, you will be threatened through the help of the United States to be killed. If you refuse to follow them, you, if, you, if, you, if you stick to the Bible, you will be the one called the fundamentalist. And you will be the one that will get problems and get into trouble. You will be the one that will get persecuted. And say, we can't have these fundamentalists here. You know, they're not obeying us, they're rebelling. They're, they keep to this, this old word, but you know, we have the authority to change it. That's what they said, right? So, but this statement here from Barack Obama, I mean, it's, it's just showing a beginning of close cooperation between the two. And you know what else would happen now? In September, the Pope will visit the United States. He will start off by visiting the White House, where Barack Obama waits to host him. They will have a talk there. And according to media, they will, uh, they will talk about... Um, let's see here. Well, uh, the poverty, economic opportunity, uh, immigration, and environment. And then... He will address the U.S. Congress. It's the first time ever that the Pope will address the U.S. Congress. And also, uh, he will address United Nations in New York. And guess what? Here, all the world leaders basically will meet. So he will speak to the whole world, basically. The heads of, of all the countries in the world. Almost. I mean, that's... Uh, <laughs> the, the things that is going on now is, is really a fulfillment, I believe in what the Bible says. And then he will participate in the World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia, which also will be interesting. And, and there are other, other things too, but this one in Philadelphia, the, the, the meetings for families, last year, or I think it was 2013, he said during meetings, these meetings that, uh, uh, or working on Sunday, or it was a general statement rather, working on Sunday has a negative effect on families. So I wonder what they will say now at this conference. It will be exciting to see. But, you know, they, they had a survey in America recently, this month, and it's showing that the Pope is getting more and more popular. 60% of Protestants have a favor, favorable impressions of the Pope. Nearly 70% of non-religious have a favorable impression of the Pope. Very interesting. It was only made, I think, by a few thousand, uh, so it's not uh, like a large-scale, uh, but it's still showing us something, and it's in line what we see in the world uh, today. And he has been meeting with so many different leaders, Pope Francis, evangelicals, Lutherans, Mormons, Jews, Orthodox, Muslim, etc. So, basically, the book of Revelation is presenting two groups. Two groups, Revelation 13, that will be in the end. In the preparation of this 500 years anniversary. So they have a theme, like a motto for every year. For this year, for last year it was Reformation politics. For this year, it is Reformation, image, and the Bible. I thought about Revelation 13 right away when I heard that. Re Reformation, image, and the Bible. The next year, Reformation and one world. Again, Revelation 13. So... I don't know what will happen in 2017, but it will be very interesting to see. You know, now is the time to choose which group you will be in, because you have to make a choice. If you don't make a choice, you will fall into one of these groups anyhow, and it will probably, it will most likely not be well. If you don't make a choice, it will, you will be in this, in the group that actually will give worship to the beasts. So we have to make an intellectual choice and choose God's group because one group will be faithful to the beast, to this false system of worship, and, and you will follow what this is saying. Almost the whole world will gather here. We saw all the world follow. But there will be one exception. It will be one group that is faithful to God's commandments, including the Sabbath, that this papers say they have changed. This will be a big question 
in the end. Because they will stick to this. And like when God sent the manna to the Israelites in the Old Testament, He said, I will send manna to see whether they will follow my laws or not. Again, the Sabbath question will be a deciding factor. God will say again, will they follow my law or not? And the, the papacy will say, look, do you need to worship on Sunday now? It, it will be a, uh, I mean, will you do it? If not, this is what will happen. I mean, will, will you follow our catechism? Or will you follow the Bible? That's, that will be the question. And will you follow our commands? So, this tells me that there will be hard times ahead. Because we read, if you refuse to follow the beast, you will be killed. You will be hated. You will be persecuted. It's going to be like in the dark, gar, dark ages, possibly worse. Well, actually, I think it will be worse. The Bible is actually clear on that. It will be, we can't imagine what will happen. So, God, at the same time, He is waiting to pour out His Spirit upon His people. The question is, are we ready to receive it in, in, the, in the fullness of the latter rain that He's longing to pour out on His people so that this world can come to an end? We are called, you know, if we forget to protest, we forget our message. And we are called to protest by sharing the three hundred messages of Revelation 14. This is, these are the last messages to this world, and we are called to share them. And the third angel is about the Antichrist, the mark of the beast. And to worship God, rather, to follow God and His commandments. Because Revelation 14.12 says, Revelation 14.12, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is God's group. Will you be part of that group? If you want to be part of that group, you need to stand up and protest by sharing the truth of the three angels that comes with a message uh, before this verse, you see. This is the last uh, part of it. And of course, we have to do this by lifting up Christ and the truth. There's no other way. God will have His people in false systems of worship until someone calls them out and shows them the truth from here. The word for church in the New Testament, ecclesia in Greek, that means call out, the call out ones. Who will call them out? And what are you going to be called into? The Bible says God's remnant. In God's remnant, chapter 12, verse 17, is those who keep God's commandments and have the testimony of Jesus. So we have to do this. God has chosen us, His church, to call Him out. This has to be done with a Christ-centered biblical message and lives transformed by the righteousness of Christ. We need to experience a relationship with Christ. We need to experience that He is living in us. And that only by Christ and His grace we are able to keep His commandments and we are able to share His message. And only by His protection we are able to do this. But someone will have to die as martyrs. It's going to be horrible. So are you willing to stand up and keep protesting? Or are you going to go with the rest of the Christian world to wander after the beast? We need to pray, we need to watch, we need to work as we behold Christ, our Savior. Here's one quote from the Great Controversy, page 571. Very fitting for what is happening. The Roman Church now presents a fair front to the world, covering with apologies her record of horrible cruelties. I've seen that. She has clothed herself in Christ-like garments, but she is unchanged. Every principle of the papacy that existed in past ages exists today. The doctrines devised in the darkest ages are still held. Let none deceive themselves. The papacy that Protestants are now so ready to honor is the same that ruled the world in the days of the Reformation. When men of God stood up and the peril of their lives, at the peril of their lives, to expose her iniquity. And that's the challenge to us. 
are we willing to expose her iniquity today by lifting up the truth? That's the question. Let's continue reading. She possesses the same pride and arrogant assumption that lorded it over kings and princes and claimed the prerogatives of God. Her spirit is no less cruel and despotic now than when she crushed out human liberty and slew the saints of the Most High. So what about you? Are you ready to wake up from the Laodicean sleep that the church, ha- the church is in a condition in right now and see the reality and take responsibility to deliver this message? The message of the everlasting gospel. A Christ-centered message. Lifting up Him in truth. The Bible. In uh, Armenia, in the year 320, <laughs> uh, there was a company of, of 40 Roman soldiers there. Very, very good guys. Very, very brave ones. Very good soldiers. They were called the Thundering Legion. You know, these were... Uh, the, the governor, he, he discovered... That they were Christians. He was very angry and threatened to have them killed. But he also wanted to keep them because they were so brave, they were so good. So he said, you know, you will get money and honors if you just would consent to worship the gods of the emperor. If you just do that, you will give mo- you get money and honor. But they responded... One responded, you offer us money that remains behind and glory that fades away. And they said, we would rather die than renounce our faith. And he got so angry when he heard this, as you can imagine, he ordered them to die a painful and slow death. He, it was winter during this time. He took a big <coughs> basin of water, put it on the ice. Cold water, or that was warm, sorry, warm water. And then he put them out on the ice, he took off their clothes. They were there naked on the ice. And this basin with warm water, he said, okay, look, if you change your mind, if you're ready to give up your faith, we will take you to this warm bath here, and you will be saved. Okay. So 40 of them went there. And they tried to encourage one another. You know, one night with suffering, and then... An eternity in front of us together with God. Okay, so they prayed that the number would remain 40. And then, you know, there was a song about this. It goes like this. 40 soldiers for Jesus. 40 brave soldiers for Christ. And they endured this, you know, torture for many hours. But then finally, one person, it became too much. And he, he said to the Roman soldier, can you please carry me to the basin? You know, I, I'm giving up. I can't take this. And they got a little bit discouraged. And they kept singing with, with, with less uh, uh, excitement. 39 soldiers for Jesus. 39 soldiers for Christ. Then suddenly, one of these pagan guards, he took off his clothes and ran to them and shouted out, 40 soldiers for Jesus. For the brave soldiers for Christ. This can come to be a scenario for you if you want to be on God's side. These soldiers died in the night, during the night, obviously. Cold in winter. But, you know, if we remain faithful until the end, no matter what happens to us, it doesn't matter if we die, we will be able to be together with Jesus. Antichrist has placed, has replaced rather, Jesus and his teachings with pagan rituals. They have casted down the truth, God's word, and Jesus. They have casted down the sanctuary, the message that we find there, the things that are taking place there that Christ right now is ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. This is all cast down by them and trampled upon. And they have their catechism, their teachings about the Bible. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and His atonement for us in the heavenly sanctuary is our only hope. So I'm wondering now, as we close, who would want to be faithful to God? In these times, there are hard times to have. And I want to make an appeal to you. 
I want to ask how many of you would like to be part of this, this group, God's group that keeps his commandments, that stand up for the message, that protest by sharing the truth. How many of you would like to be a part of this army? Of this army. This will be the smaller army. The greater army will be against us. But we are an army for Christ. And with his help, we will be able to deliver God's last message. So I would like to ask, uh, if you are ready to wake up and to speak up in love, this message, so that people that are in these false systems of worship will see the truth, and they will say, why have you not told me this before? Why has no one told me? Thank you. And they will come and join God's remnant. How many of you would be ready to do this and sacrifice even your life if necessary? This is no games. This is going to be hard. This is going to be real hard. Right now we have the freedom of speech still. But one day we won't. So now we have the time to share this message. So I would like to ask, this is a small room, but I would like to ask you, as if you want to show to God and say, God, look, I am ready. I want to deliver your message, no matter the cost, no matter how many are going to persecute me, no matter how many are going to ridicule me, I don't care. I'm ready to stand up for you, and I want to share this message of love, because I want as many as possible to hear this, and what you have called me to do. If you want to do that, I would ask you to, ask you to, to come to the front here, and I will pray for you. Is there any one of you? And don't feel pushed because this is this is this is hard. This is this is not a game. And it may be some of you don't have the the same knowledge as as someone else and are not ready to make a such a decision. I don't know your hearts, but if you feel that you are called to take this message to the world, please come and stand here, and I will have a prayer for you. So again, don't feel pushed. But if you want to join God's army on God's side, please come. Amen. I'm happy to see so many brave soldiers here, even young ones. Okay, let's have a prayer together. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word of truth. I thank you that, like it says, like you have said, I don't change. Lord, the Bible says you do not change. You change is not. So we can trust you and your word that this is truth. And we see from your word that it's, it's showing the last deceptions of this history. And it's painful to, for us to read it. It's painful for us to see what has happened in the past. And it's not nice to share such a strong uh, message seeing that so many people are still, still don't have the truth. And Lord, you see, there's an army here, there's a, an army in this room that can even become greater. That's, that says, I want to stand up for the truth. I want to keep protesting, even though people around me are giving in and, and, and uniting in a, in, a, in a false unity, not in a non-biblical unity. Father, because we know that you're not against unity, but it has to be based upon the word of God and the doctrines that we find there. And a, unity, a true unity in Christ. And we pray for such a unity among God's people and in God's remnant church that you will prepare each one. I pray especially for the people here in this room that you may prepare each one, each heart, and the people that are following us through internet. Lord, I pray that you may please help us. We need you. We cannot make this without you. Give us a stronger faith and a stronger courage and help us to speak this last message in love and where Christ is in the center. Because Christ, He took our penalty. We are all deserved to die eternally because of our sins. But because of Christ, we know it is possible for us to get forgiveness. Because of Christ's death, He died in our place. And we are so thankful for this. And Father, you promise if any man confesses his sins, 
you are faithful and just to forgive him his sins and cleanse him from all unrighteousness. And we claim his promise in 1 John 1 and 9. Father, equip these precious people of yours here in this room and those who are following online uh, and help us to see the urgency of the message. And I believe we have seen part of that through this presentation. And I pray, Lord, that you may keep speaking to us. That you may keep guide us and help us to stay firm until the end. Because hard times are coming. Help us to take care of our children and to educate them in, in the right way. And help us to, to, uh, to, to spend time with you daily in devotions, reading and prayer. Because this is the only way, Father. Dwell in us, abide in us, and we in you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.